Welcome to another episode of the Federal Newswire Lunch Hour Podcast with your host, Andrew Langer. Well, hey there, everybody. Welcome to another episode of the Lunch Hour with Federal Newswire. I'm your host, Andrew Langer. So glad you can join me today. And if you're listening to us on one of the many fine podcast platforms you can find, the Lunch Hour, please take a look at us on YouTube. Subscribe, leave us a like, leave us a comment. Uh, And more to the point, let your friends know, let your family members know, let your family members' friends know, let your family members' friends know all about the lunch hour uh, with Federal Newswire. Uh, We love having you guys join us. Joining all of us today uh, is a guest I've been wanting to have on for many, many months now. Uh, I I consider her a colleague. I consider her a friend. Her name is Veronique DeRuji. She is the George Gibbs Chair in Political Economy and Senior Fellow at the Mercatus Center at George Mason University. She's also a nationally syndicated columnist. She has a weekly column. Uh, Her primary research interests include the U.S. economy, uh, the federal budget, taxation, tax competition, and cronyism. Love talking about that. Uh, Her popular weekly columns address economic issues ranging from lessons on creating sustainable economic tax and fiscal policies. She has testified numerous times in front of Congress on the effects of fiscal stimulus, debt and deficits and regulation on the economy. Uh, She writes this weekly column for Creator Syndicate. Uh, She writes regular columns for Reason, blogs about economics at National Review Online's The Corner. Her chats, you know, something that's so funny. I had a whole shorter bio for you here. Anyway, uh, let me me come back to this, uh, Veronique, because I I just don't want to shortchange our time for for talking. Uh, Prior to joining um, uh, Mercatus, She was a resident fellow at the American Enterprise Institute, a policy analyst at the Cato Institute, a research fellow at the Atlas Economic Research Foundation. And before moving to the United States, she oversaw academic programs in France for the Institute for Humane Studies Europe. She received her master's in economics from the Paris Dauphin University and her PhD in economics from the Pantheon Sorbonne University. Veronique, I apologize for my butchering of French. I was a Russian studies. Not at all, Andrew. Like, it's just, you know, each time, I mean, someone reads my bio, I'm thinking the more, the older I get, the longer it gets. You know what's <laughs> funny? Um, on the on the, uh, the the Gilbert Gottfried podcast, when Gilbert Gottfried was still alive, uh, they always, you know, they, they made the notation that when you read somebody's bio, it really does read like an obituary. And, <laughs> and, and Gilbert, you know, always used to append when he would read the bio, found dead in her apartment, you know, blah, 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 so on and so forth. You know, yeah, um, yeah it, it gets a little long. I, <laughs> I, this is not where I wanted to begin, but yeah, I mean, do you, I find it, I find it, um, that's why I tried to shorten your bio. And I know I butchered that at the beginning because I wound up reading the long version of your bio. I find it a little, a little uh, cumbersome when someone starts off by reading. Well, then, plus in the end, um, I mean, maybe kind of like what matters is where I am right now. And sure. the fact that, you know, I just kind of, I'm really a generalist with kind of, there are things that I go, go back to always, like spend, government spending, the impact of spending on the economy, economic growth, cronyism. But, um, you know. Let's start here with, you know, you grew up in France, obviously. You, you were educated mm-hmm. in France. How did you get involved in these issues, interested in these issues in France? I mean, and and how does between the French approach and the EU approach to regulation and debt and spending, how does that compare? I mean, I know I, you, it's funny. I wasn't even thinking I was going to start that, but how does that all, how did you get into this? And and how is the difference between what you were studying over there? How does it mesh with what you're doing over here? Well, it's kind of a depressing answer, right? Oh. Because when I moved to the U S it was like almost 25 years ago. Um, it, well, it was, it was actually 25 years ago. Um, it was, uh, it was because I was like, you know what? There's no hope for France. You got it. No hope. Taxes are super high. Regulations are insane. Uh, growth. I mean, it was like 1% or less all of the time. Uh, and I was just like, there's no hope. There's this place that's this beacon of freedom and, and small government and, uh, and, it's America. I'm going to move there. And I moved with, um, we didn't move together, but my two best friends uh, in college had moved before. So it was, it made a lot of sense. And I came to finish my dissertation here 
and, and wanted to stay. I mean, it was always part of the plan to stay, but in large part is because the attraction of the US was, well, first it was not France. It was a, it was really a better place. There was a culture of a uh, smaller government. Yeah. There's really kind of, it failed to me that um, this notion of individual freedom and responsibility and, um, and and was was part of the culture in a way that it really wasn't in France, and um, and now I'm kind of I look and I'm just like how did we in 25 years things have changed so right. badly here where we've like it's it's not so much I mean the government has grown obviously just dramatically spending is is really out of control uh, we have inflation we have like but. It's more like the culture. The culture, it's like we've forgotten the right. culture that may, that makes this country you know, unique. It's one of the things that I talk about quite a bit, this idea of when, you know, and I think some of this is by design, right? The the authoritarians and the status, they, they knew that they had to undermine the appreciation for the things that that are at the essence of America, you know, individual rights, free markets, et cetera. Um, so they spent in the 50 years after the bicentennial of 1976, you know, attacking those principles, right? So when you when you can't agree that the principles underlying the Constitution are good principles because the men who wrote them were flawed, well, if if the men who wrote them were flawed, well, then those principles must be flawed, and therefore. The basis, the raison d'être, the the reason for, of our existence is is flawed. I mean, that's at least how I come back to this. So when you don't have a respect, the, 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 with the other part of it being, of course, that if we don't have an agreement of who we are as a people, um, and where we come from as a people, then we can't solve problems because we don't have that common frame of reference. Is yeah. that sort of where you're going, or where, what are your thoughts? Yeah, on? yeah. I mean, yeah. I think I think there is. I mean, there's been really lots of efforts on the right and on the left to undermine the thing, the things that we believe we held dear. And yeah. and you're probably right in the most cynical uh, uh, um, kind of interpretation of this is like it was done intentionally for that purpose, yeah. for the purpose of, of actually taking away this unity um, that existed. I, 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 and I and I say this not as a conspiracy theorist, but you know, I was a I I don't know if you know this. I was a Soviet studies major in college, so you know, my degrees in international relations with a with an emphasis on Soviet studies when there was still a Soviet Union to study. And one of the things that that um, um, we were taught uh, is that when Khrushchev came to the UN and said to the West, we we interpreted it as uh, uh, Khrushchev saying, "We will bury you," and what Khrushchev really says, the actual interpretation is, "We will be at your funeral." That Khrushchev was promising that he was going to use the the tenets of Western civilization, classical liberal ideals, to undo Western civilization. Um, so I, I sort of approach it from this: who is out there undermining it? Um, well, there are forces that have been out there undermining it for 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 many many years. You know, delivering on on Khrushchev's Khrushchev's promise. This is not where I was going yeah. to go this, but anyway, I'm sorry. Yeah. Go ahead. No, I mean, and it is really, um, and they're like we're seeing a shift in politics that's kind of i mean they've happened before right, right? but this yes. is the first time in my lifetime and i came in sure. since i came here i i think i had this very um i had this i arrived at a time in the us in 99 right where it was the heyday of 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 america in a way right we were still writing on the there was a on the on the prosperity of, of Reagan and and, and Clinton sure. effectively and we uh, and it was really there was a very clear um it was refreshing coming from France the Republicans believed in free markets they claimed they at least paid serious lip service to it they even sometimes ruled accordingly even though when they were in power they were spending a lot of money oh, yes. and Right and 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 had no problem kind of betraying these principles, but overall, and now it's like it's like. Well, you know, it's interesting you say that because let's get to that. Nineteen ninety nine, you arrive in America, and and to, to to sort of drill down on the issues. So you know, we have we have the nineteen ninety four takeover by Republicans in Congress. Bill Clinton is president of the United States, and Bill Clinton is 
confronted with this idea that he actually has to work with Congress to get stuff done. And and we we had the for, we had a general agreement for the first time that regulations they're not bad, right? You know, we can talk about the good or bad of regulations, but the point is, is that regulations have an economic cost and they have an impact on the economy. I guess that's saying the same thing in two different ways and that we need to do something. We need to guard ourselves against it. So for the first time, right, you have the Republicans and Democrats both agreeing, well, we need to assess the economic impact of regulation on the American economy. Let's produce a report every five years that shows this. Let's uh, let's engage in in uh, in something called regulatory flexibility. And I know you and I have a disagreement about small business, but we don't have to talk about that per se. But the actually, point, we could. Well, we could. <laughs> but but you know, but the point is at least using small business as a proxy for general for the generally for the economy, right? That's the area of compromise, right? Um, and you and I can talk about big corporations being rent seekers and cronies. The point is, you come to America at a time where. There's a general agreement. We need to do something about this regulatory problem. And yet here we are now, 25 years later, and regulations, right? I think in 2000, the regulatory costs of the American economy were $700 billion a year. Now, NAM's report, our analysis, CEI is a little different. I don't know where you guys come down at Mercatus, $3 trillion in regulatory costs. So quadrupled in 25 years. And, and there's no doubt the impact... Um, the impact of regulation on on economic growth is kind of, I mean, it's, it's pretty well established. Yeah. And unfortunately, right, I mean, slow growth is not just growth is not just the way that the most effective way to to increase people's welfare right. and wealth. Right. I mean, I know there's just a lot of people well, growth bashing these days on the right and on the left as if, you know, it's like it's not important. In fact, I mean, on the left, they have like they, they actually want some degrowth because of the environment, but on the right, they're kind of like this obsession about it with efficiency and with growth is really misguided when really they're just things that are more important. Well, actually, I don't think that there are things that are more important. Right? There are other things that are important than growth, right. but growth is not just like the best way to um, double income per capita in, in a generation. Uh, it's not, it's, but it's also, uh, there's an ethic to growth where if you don't have it, a lot of the things that we love, a lot of the things that make these country unique, like tolerance and 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 uh, you know and 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 all these other aspects, right. uh, peace and uh, and moderation, and it just go out the window. There's yeah. much more conflict when there there's more tribalism when there's no growth, and right. so. So this is like the and the impact of regulation on slowing down growth is just unquestionable. You know, it's interesting because Hernando de Soto and Richard Pipes, who wrote two of the seminal books that sort of changed my outlook on life, The Mystery of Capital and Property and Freedom, talk about property rights. I know I keep doing this this with my hands. Property rights as the precursor to economic growth and prosperity and stability. Mm hmm. Someone needs to do, I mean, you're looking at it from, and I don't mean this in a bad way. I think that, you know, you, you're you coming at it from the other direction, that the prosperity leads to the stability side of it. We need to, I think there needs to be much, much more of a discussion about why being on that trajectory and how protection of property rights obviously feeds into that, but why that, when people have hope in their future, right, that leads to a stable society. And when people are prospering in their society, that gives them hope. Talk a little bit about the relationship between those things and, and about, you know, what happens in Europe. Yeah, no, I mean, there's, there's just no doubt about this. It's the yeah. power of economic growth is, which the problem with our, our movement, I think is, is we're, a lot of us are economists. Yeah. And so we've mostly focused on, uh, on the, um, on the on the wealth aspect sure. of growth and how and yes it is true i mean wow. wealth i mean the 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 more growth the more growth we have um the more the more income per capita and it those who benefit the most are people at the lower uh lowers um end of the income ladder um so, so and so we focused a lot on that but there's really the the again the ethical aspect and uh, right. there's a book a really great book by uh, Benjamin Friedman at uh, at Harvard that 
uh, this book is called The Moral uh, Consequences of Growth. Sure. And it actually covers, and it's kind of, it's great because he's an economist, but he focuses on all the other aspect of growth and what mm -hmm. happens when we don't have it. And in fact, I think that a lot of the troubles that we have in the last 20 20 years or so is the product about is is the fact that growth has significantly decreased um i mean we used to have much higher annual growth and and continued right. growth and and we haven't had that in the last 20 years and i think all the tension all the polarization the tribalism that sure. we that we see i think is is a big product of uh of of the the the, the fact that growth is slowing i mean one of the things that that friedman shows in the book is is how this is actually happening in countries even when they stay rich yes it's not that they start breaking apart when they're poor they right. were used to be rich it's like argentina right relatively rich and uh -huh. becomes poor and then it, it's no actually the country is still rich but the, the the slowdown of growth, you get all the sure. same negative effects. You know, and what I appreciate about that is that is that you know, there are things you can use to objectively measure those things. One of my problems when Martin O'Malley was governor of Maryland was that he tried to substitute the you know the essentially the state domestic product or the gross state product uh, for what he called the general progress indicator GPI, which was a series of subjective metrics you know that they cherry picked to sort yeah. of show that the state was on the right trajectory when the state was on the wrong trajectory. You know, something, actually, let me, let me ask you this. And then I want to sort of dovetail into two of the other things we're going to talk about. This issue of subjective versus objective metrics for measuring, for looking at the health of a society. Um, the OMB just went through their revisions to uh, circular A4. Um, as we've talked about on this show with Wayne Cruz and others, they want to, they want to get rid of essentially measuring any kind of economic cost, they just want to focus on benefits. What are the problems when we start talking about when you start talking about subjective uh, measurements of of how well we're doing as a society? what what uh, what happens to us? Well, I mean, it's worth noting that just there are a lot of very serious non-political people who say that we have we have problem in the way we measure growth, right? Yeah. I mean, like measuring something really objectively and accurately is hard, right. It's hard enough. Right. And so, for instance, like there are people who are saying that we're probably not um, capturing enough the welfare and the economic impact of uh, things like the um, the, you know, like Uber and Lyft and the sure. apps and the app economy, um, which is we don't have real good. Um, we don't really have a good measure for that. Right. Um, in the same way as their problem with our GDP measurement, because, you know, the. If you're if you hire your deadbeat nephew um, in your company, his salary doesn't count towards GDP. Or if you invest in R and D, that that investment doesn't doesn't count into GDP until you actually produce something. Wow. Uh, if you hire that deadbeat nephew to work for the government, um, his 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 salary counts as GDP. Wow. Right. So they're they're problems. They're right. they're problems. That said, right. That said, it's like it's hard enough when you're trying to be objective. So when you try to do it in a subjective way, and and people start changing what things mean, uh, you know what what they think is important, and it, it just it's just it's unreliable. More importantly, I think one of the big problem we have with a lot of people who are making the case for more government is that they all look at the benefits and never look at the cost. Right. So that's I mean that's like the big. I mean, the cost, the cost is what matters. Right. Right. I mean, if you don't look at the cost, I mean, yeah. it just, it tells you nothing, especially considering the benefits often don't materialize. Um, but the, and the costs are, and, you know, are usually more than what, than what. Um, yeah, Ryan. Ryan Young and I spent a lot of time talking about the opportunity cost issue and the the Dawson and Cedar paper from you know twelve years ten twelve years ago. Um, well, you know, it's the other thing is kind of like um, another issue of of what what the focus should be on is like you have the new right talking a lot about how we economists and and you know market fundamentalists have spent too much time 
you know, looking at consumption because ultimately economists all the way to, to, to Adam Smith, we've said that, you know, the ultimate goal of everything is consumption, right? And they're like, there are consumption, look, globalization, we're like, we've put the consumers at the center of everything. And they gave us this, this globalization system. And all we got is cheap TVs, right? And now we're going to kind of re kind of re revamp the whole system to kind of be uh, to have producer and workers at the at the center. The, the problem is like it's not that it's not that workers and produce producers are unimportant, right? Yeah. Is the problem is that no production is economically worth it if you don't have consumers willing right, to actually course. buy it. Right. Yes. Right. And it's in that sense that we said the ultimate goal of production is cons like it's consumption, right? Absolutely. It's in the, it's only in that sense. It's not to say that consumers are superior to producers or to, but it's just simply to say that production that doesn't actually like lead right. to consumption um, is wasted. You yes. wasted resources. You you took resources towards a goal that was lower value, and sure. often what the government does. By picking production goals sure. without and ignoring consumers is 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 distort well, resource David, allocation properly. It's it's funny because David Stockman, one of the one of my you know my favorite, it was a quote that blew me away. Um, it was you know I read his book The Triumph of Politics again about twenty five years ago. Oh, I love you know it's my favorite book. If anyone asks me what my favorite book is, is Stockman is my favorite book. Oh yeah, I know, and I mine has posted like has like a 200 posted so it's completely mine is a hard cover and uh and and it's and actually I was wondering where it was that's so funny uh, yes je yesterday uh, and mine has like so many posted in it that um that I I it's almost use useless but this is this is a book this is why I started ri writing about SBA ah. about the small business administration sure. and this is why I started you know, picking on the export import bank is because yeah. of this book. Well, absolutely, and 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 you and I are, are in agreement that ninety percent of what ninety percent of what the SBA does is is garbage. Um, yeah. Um, which is me now saying I will never be administrator of the Small Business Administration. I will never ever be ever be picked because that's going to be on record. Let, let's, uh, it's, it's so funny because I literally yes I have that that book right here. But the point is Stockman talks about how dangerous and damaging it is to try to change. Um, a behavior by focusing on the demand side of things, which is everything that 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 government seems to be doing now is to try to c change consumer de demand behavior. Um, it's just messy, and, and anyway, it's imp impossible to do. Well, but, but the way they do it, the yeah. way they do it, right, is through it's by directing production right. in a particular direction, and so yesterday I read this article in the Wall Street Journal about how. Like, you know, everyone was putting money into EV and blah, blah, blah. And everyone like, and they were like, they were thinking first there, the mandates are coming and then there, right. all the subsidies are being poured. And, and during, during the pandemic, there was kind of, there was a line, there was a shortage. So everyone went full on, especially because there was the government backing. And then there was just a little problem to that whole thing is there were consumers. Right. 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 I mean, actually, when the economy started going well and people started actually kind of thinking about, um, you know, once you once you once you were done with the consumers that were going to be willing to put up with uh, EVs, no matter what, um, they just looks consumers are not interested. Right. Right. So companies are backing away. And, and that's that's one of the problem with with, um, you know, that's that's one of the problems was it was basically saying you know we're going to kind of incentivize production in a particular right. direction without letting like basically like the the the, the market right um it, you know it dictated just, i mean it gets to exactly what you're saying it is a huge waste of time and energy and resources etc to build cars that nobody wants to buy or very few. Yeah, people. there's there's the only way to differentiate between productive and unproductive activities is through the market, right. through that pull and uh 
it's through the through the forces of the market where consumers and and producers interact right. it's, it's an and their and the price signal tells you something right it's it's an organic system it's a natural system it, it, you know and when you and when you try to artificially change it it doesn't work let's you know some let's actually that's let's that's a really good entree into this piece you just did for the national review before we talk about shrinkflation on the end of policy making um and again we talk about wasted spending and out of control spending and spending that's coming up and the choices that it leaves in terms of how we make policy talk about the piece that you just did for the national review well so a piece i can't even remember why i i mentioned this but it's because jack salmon and i wrote a paper a few um a few years ago called the end of policy making yeah. and the case we're making and is is simply that uh, when you have Congress fighting over a part of the budget that is really relatively shrinking because entitlements, Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security, and interest on the debt, by the way, which is actually growing. This sure. year, we're going to be paying more interest on the debt than on we're going to be spending on Medicare and defense, for that matter. Um, so that is growing and is just basically consuming so much of the budget that effectively the part that Congress is fighting over, right, is shrinking and shrinking and shrinking and shrinking. Right. Right. And and that means that their ability to really do policy making when when it was in the 70s, right? I mean, it was like a majority of the budget was discretionary spending. And right. now we're heading you know, it's roughly 30% and we're going to head towards 20%. And that's assuming, that's assuming, right, that CBO, um, that CBO is correct about, about interest rates not going any higher than right. for four so, or so percent. So, so that's what it means. It means that effectively um, you have, you have, a part of the budget, the discretionary part, which is the part that that is used to make policy, it's used to um, that there that Congress is fighting over is 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 shrinking and is yeah. going to be shrinking more and, and more and more, and as a share of the whole budget, and and I think we can expect more and more tensions between you know, it's, them. It, it's interesting because you know I. We're, you know, you think about the regulatory trajectory that we're on um, with, you know, if we're if we if we stay on the course where we are, regulations will cost the American economy about seven trillion dollars by 2030. Um, and taking into what I was just talking about with regards to opportunity cost and what Dawson and Cedar talk about, the idea that the economy could grow. I, I, on the one hand, you would think that if we kept regulations on a glide path, let's say that we didn't grow regulations, we kept it at three trillion dollars annually. Um, over the next seven years and, and and don't add another $4 trillion in regulatory costs there, there would be a tremendous benefit to the economy. We could spur some growth. One would think that growing the economy would help ameliorate some of these problems. And then, of course, I come back to it and say, well, wait a minute. If let's say that we went, and I don't even know, I'm assuming the GDP right now is still about $21 trillion a year. I could be wrong. No, um, no, no it's, it's, it's much more than this. Is it much more than that now? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, let's say that, but let's say that we went much, much higher in terms of, of GDP and we increase revenues to the federal treasury that one would hope would offset some of these problems. I think Congress would just spend more money. They wouldn't, it, there would be no fiscal discipline instituted and we would still be spending more than we take in. What are you, what are your, I know that's a long way to go. A lot that I threw at you there. Well, <laughs> so so the regulatory side of things is different from the spending side of, of things, right? So, um, but I, I guess I never thought about it this way, but I think it adds, yeah. right, to the, um, if all you can do is build on top of a regulatory regime that is already overwhelmingly right. large, right? It means that, your 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 ability to do something that's radically different is is 
changed. Right. It, it's just, it's actually really small. Let me, really, let me be really clear about this. If I, this is again, I didn't realize I was quite this cynical, but but maybe we're exposing something today. Um, but, you know, I, I would love to be able to cut regulatory costs. Mm -hmm. um, but I've now been doing this work long enough that, you know, that to me, there I, I'm not going to say it's a fool's errand because I don't think it is. But I know that I, at least to me, the best we can hope for is to have negligible growth in regulation. So right. what, what do you think about Chevron, the, the Chevron case before the Supreme Court? This could that kind of is that I mean, a lot of people think it could be a game changer, but will it be? Well, no, I think, it, think I think it is prospectively, but I don't think it changed. I mean, yeah, unless there's a massive number of lawsuits to to sort of challenge regulations that are on the books, and given that you can only isn't challenge, that the isn't that the idea, right? I, I think I think to an extent, right? But I I also again this is the cynicism in me, and you and I both knowing when you have a, a regulatory state that's what over a, a, a million separate mandates in it you know, or, or 1.5, depending on who you talk to, um, to, to get at that and, and challenge you'd have, I mean, that's a, that's a lot of lawsuits that are predicated on the idea of people who had already filed comments in the, in the rulemakings, raising sort of the Chevron issues in them. And I suppose you could do that, um, you know, raising the, the questions of, of those things. Again, to me, I, I sort of look at it prospectively. Maybe, uh, maybe, maybe you're right. Maybe I do need to be looking at it going, going back. Um, I think, I actually think it would be a mistake for all our regulatory friends to not be ready um, when Chevron is knocked. I mean, I'm hoping is knocked out. So, so time I out think, for a second. Sir, go ahead. I think kind of. Um, I think that's the biggest opportunity on the regulatory front that we will have had um it's in an forever it's an opportunity and we have to we have to but we have to be prepared we have to be prepared for the understanding of this folks before before veronique and i started recording the show we were just sort of talking about some of the work that i'm doing and the work that she's doing and i'm going to say this not to levy you know release too much of the conversation you and i had before we went on the air but i think veronique you've now hit upon where we need to go right yeah. now now you're right now we need the effort what what does it look like in a post chevron world and getting all of the regulatory folks on board to figure out the targets and who's been involved in those targets before and where we go i think you i think you've now come up with the with the with the the the, the other piece moving forward but but I, I i mean i think i think it is key Yes. It, it's like and this. Is, right. So I let me make an analogy, and I don't know if it's going to be it's going to be a bad one or, but I think our friends who are pro life, yeah, didn't prepare for the end of row. I agree with you wholeheartedly. And yes. I think our regulatory friends are not preparing for the end of Chevron. I think you are right as well. And I think it, I think it'd be. Um, all right, that's it. All right. You, you and I, we have to have a meeting in the next two weeks. We have to get everybody to get, we got to get, got to get the band together to talk about this. It, it, so, listen, I'm, folks, I'm so thinking about, my, ending my, the pod, like, I'm thinking about literally ending the podcast right now and saying, Oh my God, Veronique just came up with this brilliant no, idea. No, it's not. I, I can't take the credit for it. Okay. You know what? You know, who is really always see things very clearly is, is the head of Mercatus, Dan Rothschild. Yes. He's always the one who's like, what are we doing on AI? What are we? And, and, you know, and literally the next week, Chad GPT is a thing. Yes. Right. And, and and he's the one who's been saying, what is everyone doing on Chevron? And of course, I'm kind of like feeling, well, it's none of my problem. I don't do regulatory you yeah. know, work. But but at the same time, I'm kind of like, I'm always, I, I can't, he's totally right. Absolutely. And 100%. I, he's All right. Right. You got to you got to connect us here. Listen, I know our, our time our time is short. I want to talk about shrink with we, you. We're going to come back to this. You and me after this, we're going to come back to this uh, shrinkflation, because that was a big thing when we're recording this show. The president just went on to talk about uh, uh, it took a Super Bowl, excuse me, Super Bowl Sunday to talk about shrinkflation. Uh, you have a really great, 
you know, you've been writing writing on this as well. Uh, talk 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 about your inflation and spending and, and where how what is I just wrote a piece on the regulatory component of this and regulatory costs going up and how that drives it. But talk about spending and 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 uh, inflation and how that creates shrinkflation. Well, so so the the reason why I wrote this piece is because the president. So it was so weird. The president yeah. decided not to do the interview before the Super Bowl, yeah. but decided to go on TikTok. Uh, recently, federal employees are, have been banned to using TikTok, but he goes on TikTok to do a video about complaining about how because shrinkflation. Uh, which is the act of having price stay stable, but companies selling you less of a product. Right. Uh, how evil companies are doing this and really companies are bad for doing this. I found it just so baffling because uh, first, first it's kind of like, like this is total, so totally 2022, right? right. We've only litigating this with the, the bat, the, the size of potato chip bags right. and, and Gatorade bottles. And, but it's also because that's what companies do when there's right. inflation and they're trying, especially for goods that economists call where the demand is elastic, means sure. that you don't really need it. So of if course. the price goes up, you're going to de decrease your demand. Um, uh, that's what that's one way that company tried to adapt right. to uh, to the rise in prices due to inflation. And by the way, it's totally legal as long as the labor, as long as you inform your consumers. But I also think that it was kind of baffling considering that this administration has been trying to kind of convince voters that, well, inflation is is, is lower right. and that meant that prices were down. And it, and so, I mean, it was just so <laughs> and, and of course, I mean, blaming companies, I think is a cheap cheap way of, of of basically trying to distract the attention from the fact that government spending is behind right. all of that inflation and the fact that the federal reserve is having a hard time bringing inflation back to target because right. congress isn't helping right yeah it's it's it, it is it is nutty um and and, and again as you add 750 billion dollars in regulatory costs to the economy obviously again it's going to come it's going to come out somewhere. Let's uh, before I let you go. Um, one of the things I like to do is uh, uh, to try to put a human face on my guests, uh, so that folks understand we're not all about policy things. I mean, we are many of us all about policy things, but I like to talk about a little bit about outside interest. When you're not doing this work for Mercatus, when you're not writing your column, what are you? What are you doing? What are your, some of your outside interests, Ver Veronique? Um, you know, I uh, I'm a very social yeah. gal. I uh, do a lot of dinner parties. I have kids. I mean, they're in college now, yeah. which I'm loving, by the way. Maybe it's the French mom into me. There's no empty nester syndrome for me. Yeah. Um, not not at all. I uh, so I see my I see my friends a lot. Recently, I've been going to the movies a lot. Wow. Uh, Back well, to the movies. Yeah, go to the movies. Yeah, wow. yeah. And uh, so I've, I've seen. Um, a bunch of the uh, the Oscar nominated okay. movies. I'd seen Barbie and and Oppenheimer, um, but I went to see Poor Things. Um, beautiful. I don't know that I would recommend it. It's the most bizarre. <laughs> movie. Well, he is I a bizarre director. I went to see director. American Story, which I thought was really well done. Uh, maybe not as funny as I thought yeah. it would be, but it's actually very, very well done. I recommend this. It's kind of like a very good criticism of white wokeness. Okay. Um, I, you know, I've just recently uh, picked up, re-picked up playing tennis after okay. 33 years. Nice. I haven't, I hadn't played tennis in, in uh, 33 years. And it's funny how, great. how much you lose. And at the same time, so how much you, you still have your doing... body still. Remember? You're doing tennis. You're doing tennis, not pickleball. You haven't joined the 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 fleet no, of pickleball people. <laughs> no, no, it's funny. It's never. It hasn't. Well, maybe maybe it's a gate. Tennis is a gateway to pickleball. But I'm having so I'm having kind of a. I'm having a fun, and I have I have. I mean, I wouldn't be it wouldn't be a complete image if I didn't talk about the fact that I have two Russian blue cats uh, that I love. Yeah, one of them was walking around in the background. More than yes, That's Emma. Cool. I'm a big, I'm a crazy cat lady. And, you know, I'd like to dispel the 
the myth that you become crazy cat lady when you have three. Actually, you become a crazy cat lady when you have one, and that's how you end up you with go. three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Tennis is the gateway to pickleball, and having one cat is the gateway to becoming crazy cat. Yes, yeah, exactly. Barry, how, how do folks find out more about the good work you're doing over the Mercatus Center? I'm, um, you know, every pretty much everything I do uh, is posted at mercatus.org. And but I blog at the corner. I uh, I I, and I have a, a creators uh, column, uh, which is which appears uh, in in several papers around the country, including Reason. Um, and so and I I tweet very. I'm a more consumer of Twitter yes. than a um, than a participant. But it's Vero Deruji. You can I try to respond to people. There you go. I got, I got tried speaking of Hollywood. I got, uh, I have a, a, a troll, uh, a Hollywood producer and I got dragged into a whole thing on regulatory costs with him over the weekend. And, and anyway, I feel, hey, I try not to get dragged into these battles on Twitter anymore. Um, but I don't, but Veronique, thank you so very much for joining us today. Thanks for having me. This, this has been fun. yet another episode of the lunch hour with federal newswire. Please uh, subscribe, give us a like. Let everybody you know know all about the show that we're doing. I'm Andrew Langer. Enjoy the rest of your lunch. This has been the Federal Newswire Lunch Hour Podcast, hosted by Andrew Langer. Check out the Federal Newswire's family of websites, as well as their social media stream, 